Okay, so I thought I would check back in with you all now that it's the beginning of turn three. As you can see, we are, let's see, we're at October 1918, uh, about to enter our first winter turn, and then the real big shift occurs here on strategic turn B, in which a bunch of reinforcements come into play, and also the map uh, dramatically opens up because this whole sort of southwest area represents... Um, sort of the occupation line by the German army or the central powers uh, once Russia had pulled out of the war and refused to have a negotiated settlement with them, they sort of took a bunch of territory within Russia and uh, held it until the end of the Great War. So this is modeled in the game by a sort of rule that restricts movement uh, into this area until um, the passage of strategic turn B and all those units come into play. So I thought I would go a little bit over what happened on turn two, and then sort of my ideas of what I want to do for turn three. So as you can see here, the whites actually were managing to push back the reds in several key areas. We were able to uh, make a really successful attack on Perm, although it was risky, it actually paid off huge dividends. And also we were able to take this group here and make a move on a uh, reduced army that was in that hex and eliminate it while also giving ourselves great strategic uh, defensive ground because we're sort of on this river, the Volga, and uh, an attack from Nizhny Novgorod is not on the Volga, so they would uh, suffer a defensive uh, odds shift if they tried to attack that group. So giving themselves some good cover here while also allowing them to attack the army that was there and eliminate a unit, which is, if you're the white player, the key is to really take out those reduced armies. You really have to reduce the army count of the reds or else you face... Um, the slow accumulation of those forces and the grouping on you and they'll and they'll just begin to take you out with their numbers. So you really have to try to do that. However, that move, while risky and you know, and handsomely rewarded because we did eliminate two armies, the real problem here is that it allowed the Reds sort of counterattack and push their way up into Simbirsk. Uh, to Simbirsk. This would have been a problem, it could have been a huge problem for the white forces had they not won initiative for turn three. So since they got to have initiative for turn three, uh, they get to decide what front activates first. And so we'll have these Siberian forces go first because I'm going to pull back this group outside of Nizhny Novgorod. I'm going to pull them back a little bit. I'm going to take these units and we're going to surround Simbirsk and attack the Latvian rifles because I will be able to get two to one odds. And since they're in a city that gets shifted, anytime you're in a city, you automatically shift the odds in one uh, factor in your favor if you're the defender. So two to one will become one to one odds. That's much better than what I could do last turn, which was only get one to one odds, which would become one to two. And and those kind of attacks, as we take a look down here at the um, combat results table, you can see that one to one is not so favorable for the attacker. You generally will take a loss, even if you get almost to the very top of the differential of, of plus 13. Uh, if you're able to go from you know, two to one odds are much better, but you can see that one to two odds are just terrible. So, so to attack some beers, I really need to be able to gather at least uh, 10 men pow man power points, which I can now do. I can attack some beers, hopefully drive the reds out, maybe even eliminate them if I can surround the city well enough. And doing that will relieve a lot of pressure on this front. I was a little worried that perhaps the reds would seize initiative, they would take the, uh, Eastern Front as their first activation and just really cut off the, the Czech army and the Cossacks uh, to the left of Simbir's care, as you can see. It'd be very easy to cut them off and then also put a lot of tremendous pressure on this whole front. If we look at the south, we can see we did very much a defensive kind of positioning here. Um, it's very difficult to get good maneuverability in this theater until after turn strategic turn B because you can see the little like barbed wire line. That's the, the border you can't cross. That's the little central occupation line, central power occupation line. So you really have no room to maneuver. As you can see, the Don Cossacks are right against that border line. And uh, you can't go too far to the east there because you'll run out of supply. So the question is really holding what you can here, making pushes when it's advisable up to Zaritsyn. It's tough because Zaritsyn is actually a special city for the Reds. It allows them to ignore retreat results until they're finally eliminated there, and then you can get rid of that ability. It's actually called the uh, Red Verdun ability. And let's them ignore all retreats. So that's really tough, because as you can see, they have the, the Volga here, and it's difficult to get units around their zone of control onto the Volga to avoid 
suffering a defensive shift for attacking a unit on a river. And that's it. That, that's, you know, that's why it's difficult in the south to make progress until this sort of area over here opens up and then you can get a maneuver over here and put pressure on these kind of fronts. So down in the south, I'm really just holding out for defensive positioning and uh, trying to keep these stacks alive because they are quite potent and they're getting more potent every turn thanks to the uh, automatic rally I get from having the Zara alive. If you remember, I rolled that. He's alive. This has been extremely helpful and it's letting me as the white player take a lot of risky moves I probably wouldn't normally do because rallying is difficult, but if you get the auto rally, you can really bring troops back and you can actually be a little bit more aggressive with their movement and placing and placement. So the Southern Front will be kind of a, a holding thing, even though the Reds have, you know, sort of lightly reinforced, but enough so that I can't really just outmaneuver them up here and cut them off from supply. However, I did get a partisan unit as my random thing for the Whites, my random event for this turn. I got the partisans. They're great. They don't ever need supply. They don't exert a zone of control, but they can be really harassing and block off supply lines for overextended armies. And the reason I put this partisan unit here is that I'm thinking if the red player tried to make a move here, then I would just take the partisan unit and cut them off there at their supply and uh, reduce that army. So it's putting a lot of pressure on them. They may have to respond and actually attack that partisan unit. We'll, we'll have to see what happens to the Latvian rifles here and the army underneath them uh, on this first Siberian activation. So that's sort of my general plan for turn three. Um, really, until you get past strategic turn B, you're really just sort of playing to take out you know, eliminated units or reduced units, I should say. You're trying to play for position. You're trying to see what's going to happen up here with the gold and the fronts. Uh, the whites are surprisingly holding out here. Usually they get pushed back. So we're going to see if they can keep their advancement going. And then after turn B, the floodgates literally open and the entire map becomes crowded with units and uh, nationalist units and more victory hexes get open. So yeah, it's going to be, uh, the game expands dramatically in scope after turn B. Okay, so that's it for this video report and I will check back in with you later in the game.